Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates for August 27th, 2021. Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense Podcast. In this week's episode, we have a lot of, to discuss about data breaches and also touching up on the past of print nightmare issues that have been resolved. So let's get in and start learning. I'm Carl. Hi, this is Ahmad via audio only. <laughs> so before we get into the topics, I did have a little thing to touch up on. Uh, Come on, I know you were talking about how you think that uh, two-factor should be more like a multi-factor authentication. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was l looking around the internet, and I found this little device here. It's called a YubiKey. And it turns out they're in the development to create a biometric YubiKey. So what this basically is, is this YubiKey is a factor authentication. It has a little cryptographic key inside it, and you pair it up with the website that you want to use, like say Google, and you want to create it so that not only do you need to know your password for the Google authentication, but you also need to plug in this key physically into your USB hub. And then when they have the uh, fingerprint reader on the YubiKey, it would also require your fingerprint to touch the key before it sends out the data to Google saying, yes, this is you trying to log in. Now, this would highly increase your security because not only do you need to know the password, but you also have this physical key with you, which is going to be very almost impossible for the hackers to have because it's going to be in your possession. And then with the addition of having your fingerprint used with the key, even if they do take your key, they'd also need to take your fingerprint with, with you, with them. So that could be an additional security method that you could be considering. So you have any thoughts on that, Ron? Um Yeah, I actually have heard of it before, the UB key. Um, and it's it's... It's interesting. I like I like the fact that it keeps everything within the device, you know, so all the uh, the authentication and logins and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if I remember correctly, let me go to their website. I think if, if you can even use it on your cell phone if you have uh, NFC and it can right. you can tap it your phone read it. Yeah, if I remember. They also have others that you can go through the Lightning port or USB C port. I see. Yeah. Yes. Or you can do the NFC if you have it. Not all cell phones have the NFC. Um, yeah. Now, who's? how do we know that the company behind this key is not keeping our information, Carl? Have you looked into that? Yeah. Cool. Actually, they are an open source uh, company, and you could look into their code to make sure that nothing is being trafficked back to Switzerland where they – make these keys. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. One of uh, one of the things I, 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 I was studying a while back is uh, uh, zero trust. Yeah. You know, it's having zero trust between, between all your devices and all your logins and you require authentication for everything. So for example, if I need to reach another computer on my network, there's there's zero trust there. It, it, that computer does not recognize the computer that's on the network. Um, and I think this something like this, an actual physical key, would 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 increase the uh, the security, add another security layer to that zero trust policy. If that's something that you uh, you want to incorporate in your in your company, in your business, or or on a personal level. Yeah, it's but, an interesting little device and I've been playing around with it a little bit and how long have you had it for I had it for about a week now okay 
And then, then how easy is it to set up and use? Oh, it's super easy. It's just a matter of plugging it in and Windows automatically recognizes it. And then as soon as you go to the website that you're you're going to register this with, all it is, is press a button and it's sent back and forth and everything is just automated. Uh, YubiKey also has instruction, detailed instructions on how to register your key with certain software vendors like Google, and LastPass, and Bitwarden. And they give you step-by-step -step instructions like, okay, go to this setting, click here, plug in your YubiKey, and it just walks you through it very easy. Any, I think anyone could do this. Okay, so you don't have to be super technically advanced to to do this, which kind of like fits in our our theme. Is like security is, is for yeah. everyone. Yeah, it's very simple. I think YubiKey has really made it very approachable for anyone, even people who do not understand technology at all. Right. Yeah. All right. So with that out of the way, now we're going to move on to a brief touching on the print nightmare issues. Hopefully this is going to be the final feed that everyone's going to talk about because Microsoft Windows or Microsoft has required the admin rights before using Windows point and print feature. So basically what a point and print feature is, it it's a feature that allows people to plug in their their uh, printers and point it off to a server to jump down with the drivers for them. And this became an issue when Print Nightmare came around because people were allowed to create malicious drivers and have them get sent to the printers instead of the real drivers. And then once the malicious driver got installed, the hacker had complete control over the system. We talked about this in the past, and link will be in the description of what episode that was about if you want to read or hear more about that. But now it seems like Microsoft has finally given, given an issue or given a resolution to this issue because in the past they've tried tackling it many times with many different patches and failed miserably. But with this one, it will require them to have admin rights. So the only thing I would make sure that make sure that you are not have any malware on your computer, first of all, because if the attacker is able to get administrative rights before launching this attack, then this would be a moot point. However, I still stand by what I said earlier in the other episodes where it's just there's no reason for home users to have a print, printer go out to a print server. Right. My recommendation is just totally disable any remote printing driver things. And there's a guide, which I will put in a description that will go over how to disable remote print drivers and just go directly to the vendor of that printer and download the drivers through them and install them manually. So that way you can avoid this altogether. And hopefully this will resolve the nightmare printing <laughs> forever, but we never know. Is, is there a way to turn off auto update for just the printer, the printer driver in Windows? Because I know in Windows, either you have auto updates <laughs> on or off. I think for the drivers, it's vendor by vendor. I don't think Microsoft does auto updates for the drivers unless the vendor specifies them inside the Microsoft update. Okay. So I think it's more of a vendor versus vendor, but it's still a good idea to check with the vendors every now and then just to make sure that your drivers are actually up to date because sometimes 
the vendor will update drivers for different vulnerabilities or add different features and just keep on top of that. We'll just make sure that your printer won't become another vulnerability. Ideally, I don't think printers should be allowed to ever touch the internet or be allowed to touch the internet. Right. And I think physically connecting your printer through a USB cable is the best option rather than using Wi-Fi. I know that might not be as convenient for some people, but that would be the most secure way to make sure that your computer, your printer doesn't, you know, reach out to the internet and say, okay, I'm here, give me drivers or updates or whatever you want to give me and then end up having your printer taken over by malicious software. And as soon as you connect to it to print something, the malware jumps from the printer to your computer and then the whole nightmare starts over again. Right. Is there anything else you want to add to this topic? No. All right. Like I said, hopefully this is the last of it. And, and so now we move on to the LockBit 2.0 ransomware attack against Accenture. Yeah, this was a pretty massive attack. Uh, the company reported revenues of $44.33 billion in 2020 and had 569,000 employees across 50 countries. Now, this made them a huge target for these attackers because they figured, just like with the Colonial Pipeline and all the other big major companies, if they have a lot of money, then they're more apt to just pay the attackers to get access to their files but unfortunately for the attackers that didn't really work out as they wanted it to so the operators initially announced the data breach of on their leak site but did not share any files as proof of attack and they had set up a timer for sure to pay the ransom. Otherwise, all the files that they had was going to be leaked online. And that counter was set for August 11th, 2021. As today is August 25th, as we're recording, so the, the countdown has expired. And the ransomware gain published a small set of data composing of 2,384 items. These included PDF documents allegedly stolen from the company that appeared as general marketing material. So my thought is right now they're just uh, exposing really minor details about it. Uh, about Accenture, just to try to scare them to say, okay, we have something more, pay us, otherwise we're going to expose everything. And according to the experts, experts also pointed out that the ransomware operators also spent a significant effort to recruit insiders from within the target organization. So they're thinking that the reason why they got hit by ransomware was because someone on the inside wants the ransomware from within their network. And I don't think there's any telling what information they had. Come on, do you, do you know what? No, yeah, all the information they had was, was what you just said. It was you know, all the stuff that's the, some of the marketing information. Um, you know, nothing, nothing valuable, but one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that I think you didn't mention is, uh, is actually the timer has been reset. There's an, I think till tomorrow, um, when they release that information, the year until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now that, that article had mentioned two things. It mentioned that Accenture had backed up and their, you know, their systems are restored 
and what, to me that's you know that's totally that's a different attack like that's like a denial of service attack versus okay like a breach where i'm, where I'm putting all the uh your customer data all your sensitive data online and you know for sale um because honestly if i was the attacker i wouldn't and the company wouldn't pay up just because you know they had they backed up their data i can just sell the information that i have to other to competitors and make my money that way yeah right so um that's that's kind of, that's that's the that's the that's what i understood from that article and from uh, you know doing some research on it um one of the one of the things i want to touch on is um that you just mentioned carl is the presence of an insider somebody inside the company now when we hear the word insider we we, we always think of oh, this evil guy this guy who's trying to you know sabotage espionage etc mm -hmm. when in a matter of fact you know when you when you see that um accenture is you know is a multi-billion dollar company that operates in 50 states not all the states in, the, in 50 countries right not all the countries in the world have the same types of laws and regulations that we do here some of these insiders could be under a lot of pressure uh they could be being blackmailed and you can tell me well how can they be blackmailed well go on linkedin yeah. and you put all your information on linkedin and as a, as a threat actor i can go on linkedin and search okay who works for accenture and then i find somebody who works somewhere in china let's just pick on china because we we can and they say you put them under under you know say okay if, if you don't do this we're going to do this we're going to do that to you and there's nothing there to protect your, your your civil liberties because their idea of civil liberties is different than what we have here and if we are going to uh think about security as a whole and how if we're going to um attack or defend against these multiple attacks that happen against us we, we need to start thinking about it from a global perspective we can't look from, we can't be inside our little bubble here and treat everybody like we are being treated here, here in the United States. It doesn't work that way. So, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I wanted to, to mention, uh, you know, when, when you hear the oh, insider, all oh, insider trading and say, there's, you know, somebody on the inside, you know, which 90% of the time, you know, social engineering can get in, um, you know, it, it's, it, sometimes I feel, I feel for those inside guys. Because yeah, yeah. you, you never know what what they're going through. Yeah, because I remember hearing stories of how someone was working for a large corporation and they ended up having a lot of credit card debt due to some medical bills. And the company basically turned around and told them, like, you need to pay this off now. And they're like, well, well what, what, what's going on? He's like, well, your credit score is starting to go down. And these attack people will notice that and try to reach out to you to try to say, hey, we'll give you, you know, $50,000 if you just give me a first name of some, someone who works there or just a couple of passwords or something. It's hard to give that up if you're really in a lot of debt and say, okay, this right. guy is offering me a lot of money just to give him something that may not seem very significant. But to them, it's worth whatever money they give them. And so sometimes, right. like you said, they're being blackmailed. Other times they're actually being tricked through social engineering. Like they get an email, they're thinking it's from the HR department, but it's not. And then as soon as they click on something, oh, no, they're totally taken over. So yeah, I agree. Sometimes the portrayal, the insider threat, kind of is kind of like misconstrued a little bit. Yeah, it just doesn't always fit what it really is. I think it should be more of like an insider, sort of insider threat, probably like insider vulnerability. Yes. So it doesn't sound like oh, it's always that person's fault, like Bill down the street, he messed up because he just gave away the password to the vaults to these ha attackers when in fact it would have been just, he accidentally clicked on a link that he thought was from HR about his paycheck and then he got compromised. It's, it, it's kind of a hard situation to begin. Yep. Yeah. All right. 
So I think, I think there's nothing else to add in that you would say? No, not, not from my side. No, so, yeah. So with these BitLocker attacks, because they have data, and there isn't 100% sure how much data or what kind of data they have, this will tie into the next topic where uh, there are many data breaches that are happening. Uh, 70 million at t customers have been having their personal data sold on the dark web. Now, at t denies that the information came from them directly. The only reason why that the data breach has even come to light is because researchers have noticed that a large a large amount of AT&T data is being sold on the dark web. So it wasn't something that AT&T actually disclosed. And if AT&T is telling the truth, they might not even have known that they were hijacked or their data was even stolen. But again, this could be just AT&T kind of just saying, oh, we don't know what happened, but it really did, but we're not telling you because we don't want you to know. And it's hard to tell which is the truth in this day and age because you have to take people for face value until the evidence shows otherwise. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if AT&T's data was uh, stolen because AT&T is a huge corporation, and like we were talking before, with a lot of people and a lot of moving parts, it's easy for things just to be overlooked or the server over here was just not configured the right way or something went wrong because there's a lot of people in a lot of different countries that operate things. and It's easy for mistakes to be made when that many people are, are working in a large corporation, which... They may or may not have the ethics or they may not have the resources to need to secure the information. Because as we've seen before with T-Mobile, sometimes corporations see security as a cost rather than a benefit. And because it costs them money, they're less likely to, to invest or or I consider invest, but in their eyes, buy into security to not have a tangible return on that investment. Well, that and also there are no consequences right now. There is no, there, there is so, no. there's not enough regulation. No. Um, all these companies know that when there is a data breach and your information that you trusted them with is exposed, there's nothing that is going to happen to them. No. Nothing. At most, is they'll probably get a small fine that they can pay off with their pocket change. Yep. yep. So they'll if probably that. just look at it and it's okay. I spend millions of dollars on security or a hundred thousand on just paying fines. Or which one am I going to choose? Yep. And sadly, that's the case. And it's not just AT&T that is suffering from data breaches, but tens of millions of private records from many corporations and government agencies. Right, so dozens of major corporations, state and federal agencies, and other organizations have had data leakage. Some of the companies included American Airlines, Maryland's Health Department, New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and also Ford. And the biggest one is the US State Department. Now, yep. the data leakage that happened was due to misconfigured settings in their Microsoft software. And also, there was a huge Microsoft flaw that was disclosed to Microsoft from a researcher back in January. But however, Microsoft didn't uh, 
patched those things up until recently. And that flaw was used in some of these attacks to get this big, huge amount of data out there. So what's the biggest concern about these data breaches? The biggest concern is the attacker now has all the information that they need to impersonate you or to take over some accounts or <clears throat> do a swim such a sim swap attack or do any number of attacks against you. Now you may think, oh, I'm just a little person. No one's really going to care about me. But when it comes to your identity, everyone is valuable because if they can pretend to be you, they can take out credit cards, loans, and get their hands on so much amount of money. And they're not going to be the ones on the hook for it. You will be. So if you're not keeping on top of your credit score and making sure that things like your accounts are in proper order, the attacker could easily come in, hijack your identity, pretend to be you, get a bunch of money, and then just disappear and leave you with the bill. Now, the things that I recommend doing to protect yourself against these identity thefts, especially with all these data breaches, uh, the first thing to do is see if your passwords are compromised. You can go to Have I Been Pwned and put in different passwords to see if they do appear in data breaches. If they do appear in, your, in these list of data breaches, immediately change that password and never use it again because the attacker does have it now and they can easily go into your account. Uh, the next thing that you will need to do is to change any PIN numbers on your phone so that it will be harder for an attacker to take over your account there. And depending on the carrier, this could be as easy as logging into the website under your account and going into the settings and security and then just changing your PIN. Or you could easily just go into your carrier's physical store and talk to a representative there and have them help you go through the changing the PIN process. And the last thing I would say to do is to either freeze or lock your credit. What the advantage of this is, if you do this, it will be impossible for an attacker to take out a line of credit on your name because the account is basically either locked or frozen in the states where no new changes can be made to it. All the three major credit bureaus allows you to do this for free. And you just go to their website, either call them or some of them even have a little app where you can just swipe left or right to either unfreeze or freeze or lock and unlock your credit. This is hugely beneficial for everyone because, like I said, if you put these security layers on your accounts, no one can just go into a credit card company and say, okay, I am Bill whoever, here's all my personal information, and they go run it and say, oh, your account's been frozen, I can't give you this line of credit. And then they just disappear because they know that they can't get what they want, which is your, which is money. And sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Try you. You're talking about what the threat actors yeah. want from you. What you know? Why are they after your information? Mm -hmm. And there are links in the description that will go over to more details about how to either put a lock or a freeze onto your credit reports. And again, it's hugely, hugely recommended from me and every other cybersecurity expert that you should take these data breaches very seriously and take the actions to protect yourself. Because obviously, like we've said, the companies aren't going to really look out for you. They don't really care because there's 
they're not going to get in trouble for this. The only ones who are going to suffer are for you, me, and everyone else who don't take this seriously enough to take the extra steps to add that extra layer of protection in your life. Like we've always said, security is about layers. There is no one size fits all everything. Like you may have strong passwords, and then on top of that, you two factor, and on top of that, or credit freezes, and on top of that, just locking down your computer so that it can't get infected with malware. And all these controls work together to keep you safe in the digital world because everything on the internet is basically out there for everyone to see. I don't care what anyone says. Oh, it's behind passwords, whatever. These data breaches prove that even if behind a password and all these security controls, your data is still accessible and still available to people. Is there anything you want to add? Anyone? Yeah, you uh, you had mentioned a website that you know all of us nerds know about, which is have I been pond.com, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or which is owned, but you know with a P instead of the O. Mm -hmm. um, there's another website called, uh, there's another tool on, on, on cybernews.com. Uh, uh, it also checks your email, but in addition, also checks your phone number. So you put your phone number in there, because I know have I been owned that is only email addresses. Mm -hmm. If you go to cybernews.com under their tools section, there's a tools tab. Uh, you click there, you'll see there's one for personal data checker, and you can put your, you can put your, either your phone number or your email address. Yeah, which is pretty cool. I've never seen the one with the phone numbers before, but it's a good addition now that we yeah. have, you know, those leaks that just happened at AT&T and T-Mobile. And... Yeah. yeah, the funny thing is this tool that they're using is actually using databases from Have I Been Pwned. Yes, yes. So if you're not very comfortable with going to that or can remember that, you can, this is another... Uh, site you can go to to check the same data as how I've been pwned. It's very secure. They don't use your actual password. What they do is before they send your password, is they hash it into an undecryptable string of numbers, and then they use that to compare to other hashes in the databases that they created. So that if those two hashes match up, then they know, okay, they have a match. Your password is in this database. Same thing with your phone number and email address. They don't actually send those out. They just send the hash of those out to compare with the database that they have. So it is very secure, and you don't have to worry about any information getting leaked out because even if an attacker does manage to copy this in transit, all they get is a bunch of string of numbers you know, of a hash, which isn't very useful for them because they can't take that hash back it out into the password or phone number, or whatever you're actually needing to do. Right. Now, as for the uh, Microsoft vulnerabilities and how they become the big problem, I have a quote from Steve Gibson, Gibson that kind of in his words, explains why Microsoft aren't always so forthcoming or um, aren't always on top of patching all of these exploits. So he says, this is an explanation that perfectly maps onto all of our, all of the evidence and exactly predicts the behavior where we are all with witnessing from Microsoft. And this proposal mo proposed model, the driving motivation is indeed a brutal cost benefit analysis, but one that is more brutal than we imagined. It's, it's just not the obvious cost benefit analysis I was focused upon and described later or last week. Last week, I was assuming that it would only be hostile and malicious adversaries who would be uh, sorry, who would be attacking users of Microsoft software. Thus, the cost in the cost-benefit analysis would be the attackers themselves. But what if instead the attackers were the benefits 
And what if those benefits arising from a tax were so beneficial that they outweighed the cost to Microsoft, which we've already determined to be exceedingly negligible due to Microsoft having billions of dollars and they could basically take what they have and easily patch everything for the rest of time, basically. So then he continues. So then we have to ask, how could a tax on Microsoft properties or proprietary software be beneficial? Such a tax would give the U.S. national interest if they were being conducted by the United States domestic intelligence services against U.S. foreign adversaries. I recall mentioning on this podcast many years ago that Microsoft routinely tipped off our U.S. intelligence agency about recently discovered and not yet patched flaws in Windows in their various other products. So basically, Microsoft has been tipping off the U.S. government saying, hey, we have these string of unpatched vulnerabilities. Are they of any interest to you? And Bruce Snyder also chimes in and says, we know the NSA receives advice or advanced warnings from Microsoft of vulnerabilities that will soon be patched. There's not much of a loss if the ex- exploit based on that vulnerability is discovered. So basically what they're trying to say here is it seems like the reason why Microsoft is so slow at certain patches is because it could be that the U.S. government is benefiting from these flaws somehow. Mm. And if they patch them up then they can't use these flaws against their foreign enemies that also have these Microsoft uh, software they're using, which kind of makes sense, but it's also kind of scary how a company could allow this to happen in America where we're supposed to be having a separation where the corporations aren't really bowing down to the government and vice versa. But here we see kind of like a partnership between them where Microsoft sells the government software and the government gets tipped off on certain exploits and vulnerabilities so that they can use those to attack other people or other countries. So the takeaway for this is possibly just if you're really really concerned about your microsoft products um either spying on you or just leaking your data out to the world is just move away from microsoft and go towards an open system like linux at first it will be a high learning curve but if you are truly concerned about Microsoft products being a danger to you, then that's your only option right there. Because even turning to Apple, it's another closed source system and who knows what they're doing behind the scenes also. So Linux is, will be your only option if you truly feel that the closed source community is not benefiting you. Do you have any thoughts on that, Omar? No, I, I agree because, you know, if we wait on the government to regulate and we wait on companies to do the right thing, we will be waiting a very long time, um, be, you know, because companies are after the profits. That's all. It's, it's just the bottom line. And just like you said, mentioned earlier on the podcast and that the uh, um, there's no there's no like it would cost a lot more for a company to patch a security flaw than it is to just let your information out there and, and the public being sold. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, yeah, I, I mean, I agree that, you know, governments in general should work for the good of the people, but though in this day and age that we live in, governments are working for the good of the governments. And yeah. if the government of the United States is finding it's more beneficial 
to use. And you had mentioned, you know, we can we can use the, these flaws externally. I don't doubt that they use it internally. I don't doubt that they use it in, in the United States. I mean, you look at uh, you look at the, the Edward Snowden issues. You know, look at and you read his book Permanent Record, and you'll you know he'll, he'll, you'll see all that stuff on there. Um, so yeah, I, I, ideally, uh, and 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 I've and I've always preached this: move to open source. Move to open source. Why? Because the more people that that are watching and monitoring the codes and 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 and, and those softwares and, and 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 the operating systems that and there's open source for everything. I mean, you want you want Office Go? There's Libra. You know, you can get Libra or 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 Open Office or you know you you, you will get get Mozilla Firefox or get Give a Brave browser instead of uh, you know uh, uh, Internet Explorer or whatever. Uh, so yeah, you have to take it upon yourself to uh, to protect your privacy and, and anonymity and protect your data out there. And I strong, I'm a strong believer in open source software. Yeah, I try to use open soft, so the open source software everywhere I can. Um, I know. So go on what you said that if there are more eyes on it, the easier it is to catch things. Take uh, Audacity, for example. They recently got caught trying to sneak in basically spyware into their software. And the parts that they tried adding into to Audacity was copying information about what your system is, what type of file you're working on, they claimed they were doing this to try to prevent piracy from happening, but in reality, it kind of overstepped the bounds a little bit because Audacity is supposed to be a free open system where you can just edit your, your audio files without having to worry about someone watching over your back. But because they recently were purchased by a major music company, now they're adding in possibly try to add in this little spyware to see okay are people working on proprietary uh, copywritten music or not and the community just lost it when they found out what was going on and it forced the company to actually backtrack their plans and not add the um, add the spyware into it but unfortunately for the company, many people are starting to fork or what is known as what's known as forking, which is basically taking the open source software and creating a new product that has the same features so that they take the source code because it's open source and free public for everyone They take the source code, strip out anything that they don't like, repackage it and send it out. Say, OK, here's the new good product without all the spyware on it. And if it wasn't open source, it wouldn't be possible to do that. Yeah. All right. So I think I think that was good discussions that we had. A lot of database breaches and just protect yourself by watching your credits. There's many software or many things you can do, like freezing your credit, doing credit karma to basically look at your credit scores, make sure no one is stealing from information from you. And all the links that we've discussed are in the show notes below. And I think that will conclude this week's in Simple Cyber Defense. And we'll see you next week when we discuss further of new vulnerabilities in this world. All right, bye. If you like what was in this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. For more information, to suggest a topic, or to donate, head over to simplecyberdefense.com.